There's a new model out of Columbia University that's getting a lot of attention today, showing that if people across the country had started social distancing just one week earlier in March than we did, we'd have around 36,000 fewer deaths at this point. Again, it's just a model which the president today called a political hit job done by a liberal institution. And whatever you think of that assessment, I think we all have to agree hindsight is 2020, though foresight is what we elect our leaders to exhibit. As for the present situation, here's where things stand. Global cases have now topped 5 million and we're rapidly nearing 95,000 U.S. deaths. And yet every day, the president is pushing for people to get back to life as usual. Next year is going to be an incredible economic year for this country. I want to get our country back to normal. I want to normalize. This afternoon, the president visited the Ford factory in Michigan, where state law said he had to wear a mask. And yet he opted to defy that, going in without any facial covering, saying he was, quote, given the choice and, quote, didn't want to give the press the pleasure of seeing him in one a few hours after offering up this dizzying explanation of his current coronavirus status. I tested very positively in, a, in another sense. So negative. this morning, yeah, I tested positively toward negative, right? So, no, I tested uh, perfectly this morning, <laughs> meaning, <laughs> meaning I tested <laughs> negative. <laughs> but that's the way of saying it, positively toward the negative. Don't even ask. But back to his push to reopen the country. If you listen to the nation's top infectious disease expert, you're not exactly hearing the same message. If you look at the curves in our country, it isn't like everything is dramatically going down. Now is not the time to tempt fate and pull back completely. And if you think you're safe here in Massachusetts just because Governor Charlie Baker is taking things slowly or that you're isolated from the virus spreading elsewhere, think again. A new study from the Social Analytics Lab at MIT suggests we may be only as safe as our weakest sister states across the nation. I'm joined now by one of the study's author, Sinan Aral. He's director of the MIT Initiative on the Digital Economy. Thanks so much for joining us. My pleasure. So I don't think there's any doubt that we have gotten virtually no leadership from the federal government. There is very little coordination between the states other than this sort of loose northeast uh, collaboration that exists. You've determined you can actually calculate the cost of this chaos, the cost of this lack of coordination, even if you're in a state that is under control. Did I get that right? Well, what we find in our extensive research is that one state or county's policies significantly affect mobility in other states and counties. And it's not just in geographically proximate states, but often at great distance through behavioral influence over social media or other communication. Give me an example of what, what you mean by that, where a distant state might affect our mobility behavior here, let's say, in Massachusetts. Well, the, our work provides governors maps to coordinate uh, in the absence of national guidance. And these maps show every one of the 50 states which other states influence them the most. So I'll give you two examples. Uh, Georgia is most influenced by neighboring states through travel. So when Georgia reopened, uh, the University of Maryland estimated about a half a million people came into Georgia from neighboring states, North Carolina, South Carolina, Alabama. It was about a 13 percent increase and in about 62,000 additional visitors per day to patronize restaurants, bars, barbershops mm -hmm. that were closed in their own states. But uh, Florida is most influenced and affected by New York, primarily Why? through, well, primarily through social influence. So Kara Swisher, the columnist, had a column in the New York Times where she explained how she had to convince her mother, who lives in New York, to stay indoors despite what she was hearing uh, on the news and despite those uh, the orders in, in Florida to allow people to go on beaches. And so while we are sheltered in place, we have gone online in record numbers and we are talking to each other. So social connections from Massachusetts to California or New York to Florida matter in terms of our behavior. So and how much do they matter? Did I read the summary of this thing right? 
that said that if one third of your peer states, I assume in this case it's like Florida and New York, act in a certain way, that has the same consequence as if you took that act, uh, adopted that behavior in your own state? Did I get that right? Exactly. Uh, when, 30, when 36 percent of your peer states adopt shelter in place policies, it causes people to stay at home in your state as much as your own policy does. So can, does it go in both directions? Let, let me categorize it, I know judgmentally, as uh, bad behavior and good behavior. If, there's, if you're engaging in good behavior in your state, but your peer states, whatever they are, 36% of them are behaving poorly or badly or irresponsibly, that could undo the impact of your otherwise healthy behavior back home? The short answer is yes, and in two ways. First, there's travel. So when the origin state adopts shelter-in-place policies, but the destination state uh, has no shelter-in-place policies, it actually increases travel uh, into the destination state. Uh, and only when both states adopt shelter-in-place does it reduce travel between the states. And secondly, uh, what our model shows is that uh, when states don't coordinate, they diverge in their policies. So, for example, a state may have to implement more restrictive policies in order to compensate for their loose Understood. neighbor who is uh, adopting a looser set of restrictions. Did I read this right? You call this loss from anarchy? Is that, is that what you describe it as in your uh, study? There's actually a long literature about coordination, uh, about the price of anarchy. And so our results really? are based on a similar model. So for those who think this is far-fetched, and I did it first until I read this thing, give us, I assume there are tons of other examples where peer states, peer institutions, peer whatever, have a dramatic effect on your own behavior long distance. Give us an example or two if you can. Well, a couple of examples. We know, and we know that mega regions are coordinating because there are regional spillovers due to travel. So people seem to find intuitive the fact that people might go across state lines and therefore we need to coordinate regionally. The New York, Florida example is a good one because there are lots of families across generations that live in New York and Florida or that have homes in New York and Florida, and maybe one part of the family is in Florida while the other part of the family is in New York. We find, for instance, that California influences Massachusetts a great deal, uh, primarily because there are social connections, family connections, and communication happening across those states. Uh, and so there are lots of examples like this where uh, people's social relationships are not geographically proximate, but they're socially proximate. So uh, when you say 30, you need 36 percent of your peer states, when there's a huge disparity in size, uh, like in California uh, to Massachusetts, if California acted one way, that state alone you're suggesting could have an undoing or a doing effect on how we behave here in Massachusetts. Is yes, that right? The, the, yes, the states with the uh, largest population totals have the most influence because they have uh, people who are, they are connected to through their citizens in so many places and so many places listening to what they're doing over social media, over the phone, over video chat and so on. And I assume the impact of this relationship thing, for lack of better expression, is even greater now, because since most of us are locked in, social media, social connections are even more dramatic than they were before. That's obvious, right? That's absolutely right. All of these companies are breaking records every day in terms of usage, Facebook, Twitter, Zoom, and so on. The graphs look like this, going straight up. And so while we have scurried off the streets and sheltered in place, we have all logged on and we are talking to each other over these digital technologies. So what's the moral of the story? The good news is I understand your study and I'm convinced. The bad news is Donald Trump is not going to read your study and say, I really have to do take a more active leadership role coordinating what's happening in the 50 states in D.C. Maybe a Governor Newsom and a Governor Baker might coordinate. But but what is the what's the takeaway? What's the takeaway? 
Well, this is the reason we provide the uh, coordination maps for the governors of all 50 states. Uh, each one of the states can look at those maps and see which other states are influencing them the most. And our recommendation is that the governors of the states that are influencing each other the most coordinate with each other, even if it's not geographically prox proximate. What does that mean? It means to establish regular communications, for instance, to give advanced warning of changes in policy that are coming down the pipe in a particular state so the other states can prepare and or, for instance, um, uh, coordinating, knowing that uh, you are going to relax certain policies. I can change my policies in concert, but also being responsible citizens, knowing that your policy in your state isn't just going to affect your citizens, but also citizens around the country. This is the type of coordination that these maps enable among the governors themselves. Sinan Aral, I love this, and I hope people follow your advice. Thanks so much for your time and your work. Appreciate your time. Thank you.